All right, we're gonna just jump into this. Uh, looking at now, here it is, the um, zeroth and second order reactions. So, okay, we're sharing. So zeroth order um, with respect to a particular reactant, again, means we shouldn't see any change in um, rate as we alter that concentration. And here's our graph for zeroth order integrated rate law. For the first order where we needed to plot the natural log of the concentration versus time, for the zeroth order, we're just plotting concentration versus time. And again, it gives us a straight line plot. So if we get all of our rate data and we plot the change in concentration over time, um, or we uh, plot what the concentration is versus time, we should see a straight line plot. If we do, we know it's zeroth order. If we don't, we don't necessarily know if it's first or second order, but we do know it's definitely not zeroth order. Um, straight line, again, it's a negative slope. Slope is equal to negative K, and here's our integrated rate law right here. Same way you can derive that from the plot itself. Here's our y-axis, which is concentration. Uh, M is the negative K is our slope, times T, the time, which is our X, and then the initial concentration is the Y-intercept. Uh, and half-life, we'll get into those in a little bit. Um, but again, zeroth order, plot concentration versus time. Straight line, it's zeroth order, and your slope is equal to negative K, your rate constant. Second order reaction. Now, we should see, as we change the concentration, we should see a much greater effect on the rate. Double the concentration, quadruple the rate. Triple the concentration, uh, get a ninefold increase in the rate. So these plots here, we have to now plot, you'll see one over the concentration or the inverse of the concentration versus time. And if we do this, we get a straight line plot. And now we get a straight line plot with a positive slope and that slope is equal to K, not negative K, but just K. Um, so if we get our data, again, that's what people will usually do is they'll obtain experimental data, they'll try plotting just the concentration versus time. Do I see a straight line or not? Okay, let's try to plot the natural log of concentration versus time. Do I see a straight line? No. Let's plot one over the concentration versus time. Do I see a straight line? So they can relatively quickly figure out if it's zero with first or second order with respect to that um, reactant. And here's, again, the equation of our line, which happens to be our integrated rate law for a second order reaction. Um, we'll go through some conceptual questions. We'll sort of summarize, again, these rate laws, and then I'll let you guys go from there. Um, so the reaction A to B has been experimentally determined to be second order. So second order with respect to A. The initial rate is 0 0.01 molarities per second. So that's how quickly we're forming uh, that react or that product or losing that reactant per second at an initial concentration of A of 0.1 molarity. What's the initial rate at A equal to 0.5 molarities? Well, in this case, we went from 0.1 to 0.5. So we quintupled our concentration. So we'd have our concentration A, if it's second order, raised to the second power. What's five raised to the second power? 25. So we should go from, we should take that 0 0.01, that initial rate, times 25, gives us 0.25 molarities per second. So what do we do if we have multiple reactants? In those cases, we have to set up specific reaction vessels where we're only changing the concentration of one of the reactants and not the other. Just like anything in science, right? Anytime we have multiple variables, I can't probably figure out or test my hypothesis properly if I'm changing multiple variables at the same time. I need to identify, here's my four variables. Let's hold these three constant. Now let's change this one and see what happens. Now let's hold these other three constant. Let's change the second one. Same thing with these. I have multiple reactants, A and B. So I need to set up two reaction vessels, one with this concentration of A and another one with a different concentration of A, but the concentration of B in each one is gonna be constant. And then do the same thing. Now I want two reaction vessels where I'm changing the concentration of B, but holding the concentration of A constant. So I can see how much changing that reactant concentration affects the rate. If I double it, does it double the rate? Does it not affect it? Does it quadruple it? Whatever. Um, we'll do some sample problems like this from your book where you can actually see when we have multiple reaction vessels and we change those initial concentrations, how does it affect the rate? How do we then determine everything within that rate law? 
what's the value of m, what's the value of n, and what is our actual rate constant k. And then we can find, of course, once we know m and n, our overall reaction order. Um, so try a couple more conceptual questions. I'll stop with this video, keep it short, and then I'll do another video where we work a lot of sample problems. Uh, the reaction is experimentally determined to be first order with respect to O2 and second order with respect to NO. Now that is not because of the stoichiometry, that just happens to be a coincidence. That had to be determined again experimentally. The diagram shown here represent reaction mixtures in which the number of each type of molecule represents its relative initial concentration, which mixture is the fastest. So these two little red uh, spheres are O2, the blue red is NO. So here we have three and three, over here we have four and two, and here we have uh, two and four. So if it's second order with respect to NO, changing the concentration of NO is gonna have a much greater effect on the rate than changing the concentration of O2. So which one of these do I think would um, have the fastest initial rate? That should be C, because we could even plug that in if we just take the raw numbers, right? For the O2, I have two, raised to the first power is two, and for the NO, I have four, raised to the second power is 16. So two times 16 is you know, much different than say four times, um, I guess four, that would actually be identical-ish but I think really what they're focusing in on here is that the one with the greater concentration of NO because NO is gonna have a much greater effect on the uh, reaction rate. Half-life, you've probably heard of this before, especially with regards to um, radioactive materials. What does it actually mean? It's the time that it takes for us to go from whatever our initial concentration is to half that concentration and so on and so forth. If we went through two half-lives, one half-life would give us half our initial concentration, two half-lives would be a quarter of what our initial concentration was. Um, everything has a different half-life, each type of reaction, and the equation for this half-life is gonna depend on the order of the reaction. So here's an example. At time zero, we have one molarity. If we go through one half-life, if our half-life is 100 seconds in this case, then we'll have half of that amount at one half-life at 200 seconds, which would be two half-lives, we'd have a quarter, and here we would have um, an eighth, and so on and so forth. Um, so the images shown here depict the first order reaction A to B at various times. The black circles represent reactant A. The red circles represent product B. What is the half-life? So if we count all these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, looks like we have 10. So the half-life would be where we've lost half of those and we've gone to five. One, two, three, four, five. Looks like the 90 seconds uh, time is where we have half of our original quantity of reactant A, and yep, there it is, 90 seconds right there. Um, first order reaction has a half-life of 25 minutes. If the initial concentration is 0.3 molarity, what is the concentration of B after 50 minutes? So this one's really nice. We'll do some sample problems later where we actually have to use the integrated rate law to figure these out. But here, if it's 25 minutes, 50 minutes is how many of those? Two, two half-lives. 25 goes into 50 twice. So. One half-life, we'd have 0.15 left. Another half-life should be 0.075. Um, so they want to know, what is the concentration of B? So how much are we going to make? So if we lost, um, or if we had 0 0.075 of A remaining, that means we've lost or created 0.225 because we have a one-to-one -one ratio of A to B. And there it is right there. So pay attention to the wording of these problems too. Sometimes they'll ask you, how much of the reactants remaining? Or how much of the reactant did we lose? Other times they're gonna ask you about the product instead. How much of that product did we form? So you have this table in your book. This is kind of nice because um, it lays everything out on one page. So this is something I would bookmark for an exam. You can see zero with first, second order rate laws. What are the integrated rate laws? What do we need to plot to figure out if it is that order? And what does that plot look like? What is the slope equal to? And then here are the equations for those half-lives, which we're gonna get into in a little bit. Um, so we're gonna uh, start working on some problems, really look, dig into that integrated rate law in the next video, and really dig into those half-life expressions. But this kind of wraps up the basics of rate laws, zero at first, and second order rate laws. I'll see you in the next video.